Tanya, share with me if you have any sort of encouraging words uh, for somebody who's new to the industry to, you know, help inspire them to continue and, and find their passion. The first thing that I like to think is that if there's someone that you admire um, in the industry, talk to them. And there's something that, which is really very simple that you do in other industries and it's information, um, information interviews. And by doing that, you can figure out what it is that you like and you don't like, but it also opens the door to ask that person to mentor you and work with you. And being a mentor can just be a word or a line, something that's encouraging that you say to that person. And it doesn't have to be one set continuous um, exchange. It could be many small exchanges and it all really makes a difference. You know, um, I was texting with a young woman today. I put a, a photo up and um, she said to me, you know, thank you so much because you're, you're such an inspiration to, you know, to rookies like me. And I said, you're not a rookie, you know, you are an up and coming person that is a part of the new generation of black wine professionals. You're not a rookie, you know? And, and I even said, me having this conversation with you and us having this exchange, I'm mentoring you. I'm giving you empowerment right now. And it's things like that. And it's really very small, but in the scheme of things, it's really very big. That's really cool. Um, I love that. And I wanted to kick it over um, to Emily to kind of um, embellish on this because um, in our cause entrepreneur community, we have a lot of people new to wine um, mm -hmm. and some people who love wine but are new to selling wine and talking about wine. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of times people are thinking, oh, but I don't know anything about wine. I don't know anything about wine. Yeah. Or, oh, I have to be a master sommelier to know mm -hmm. anything about wine, you know? Mm -hmm. And then looking at what that road would be like is just daunting. Like, why would I even try? I'm just going to go back and do something yeah. else that I knew. <laughs> so what would you have to say about that? You know, I think that I mean, yes, wine can be intimidating. You scratch the surface and you fall, you know, 5,000 feet. Um, but it's about kind of taking it in bite-sized pieces. And, you know, the first thing I say to people who are like, I don't know anything about wine. It's like, well, do you know what you like? And they're like, oh, yeah, I like wines that taste like this. It's like, well, that automatically makes you an expert. I can't tell you what you like. Only you know what you like. And from there, you can grow. And then um, it's about, you know, just develop, understanding First, you start with what you like, and eventually you will hopefully be able to describe what it is that you like about that wine and you know, what you gravitate to. And then from there, you can start to kind of build on that and say, well, if I like this, then I might also like this. And, um, and then and you can just, you, then you're starting to develop your language about wine, describing the things that you like, what things are similar. And then just, you know, I, I always say to people that, you, know, the, you don't have to have a heavy structure to your wine learning. I just get curious. You know, if, if it's not a subject that makes you curious already, then it might not be for you. you know, but, it, but if it's something that just makes you go, oh, gosh, I want to learn more, just have fun with it. You know, watch the films, read the books, and you know, dive in. And if you feel like you want to really get serious and structure your learning, that option is out there. But um, it should be fun. You know, your learning, your learning should be fun. It shouldn't be intimidating. Um, it should be something that you enjoy and you should have a glass of wine in your hand as you're doing that studying and uh, as you're doing that exploring. I love that. I love that because I know all of you have teams and you've described, you know, you mentor um, the next generation that's coming up. You have teams that help you execute these amazing wine programs, whether it's in winemaking um, or in the hospitality industry. And Jessica, I was going to ask you, 
um, you know, making your title, it sounds like, oh yeah, I'm a winemaker. And then, you know, okay, but it's a lot more than that. The level that you are executing um, these wines and the teams that it takes to help you develop these world-class wines that are enjoyed by so many, I know isn't easy. And I wanted to see if you could share maybe your most useful leadership tool or tactic for growing teams. Um, in our community, our cause entrepreneurs are also doing the same thing, where they're mentoring, um, you know, individuals who are coming into the business. And I think any useful sort of leadership tool or tactic you have to share would be so great. That's a good one. Um, I think the most important skill is listening for any leader, is to listen um, listen and then make sure that your you know your team members have the tools to get their job done is a big part as well because there there's a lot of um you know i think for, for our team there's an expectation to work at a at a high level and um, we run very lean and and we expect everyone to have a mentality of being an entrepreneur and sometimes that is it's actually very re rewarding, but you, it's also sometimes can be daunting if you don't have all the resources that you need. And sometimes you don't need all the resources that you think you need, but that's why the listening is very important. <laughs> so making sure you have the tools that you can empower your team to get their, to get the job done is important. Um, but, but really like the listening, um, you know, like for example, when, uh, we have you know, process improvements, a very important part of what we do because we make so, such large volumes of wine that it, it, listening to our, um, our members that are on, on the cellar floor, hooking up the hoses to the tanks to do the racking, you know, they, uh, they know best how to get their job done. And we may be giving them instructions of how to do something and you know, they, they can come up to you and say, hey, you know, I've really been thinking about this, this would, this would you know, allow us to get this done faster and we could, you know, it, it would be cleaner or, you know, those type of continuous improvement. Um, the, that has to come from listening to your team because they, they know day in and day out how, how to get the job done. Um, so I think that's the most important part of being a leader. I like that. And I always am surprised about how much time it takes to listen. So we get busy and, you know, we've got to execute on the things that we need to get done to be successful in our roles and making that time and creating that space is so important. Do you have any suggestions, Tanya, about, you know, making that space and time for, for your teams? For me, it's about making lists for myself. Um, but again, it goes back to empowering people. Um, and especially in my role, I don't have um, a SOM staff. I have other managers and I have a large staff. And so what that means to make sure that everything gets done, I have to do a lot of wine education. So we taste constantly. We taste probably every day. Um, I'm always having conversations with staff about wine, um, about wine production and food and wine pairings. If I have someone that's on staff that's really excited about wine, I make sure that I'm always talking to them about wine. And if they think there's something that they want to do differently and shift gears, I'm there for them for that. And it's important to do to feel empowered because the times that I'm not available and I can't get it to a table, they can do it themselves and they feel good about it and they're excited. So, you know, there's that. And then working with, with chef and I figured out early on that it was a good thing for me to make sure that he was um, in the scheme of things and a part of tastings because the wine list really is geared around the kitchen. And I figured out, hey, I can find out what he's going to do next, what's coming up next within menus 
by bringing wine in and bringing him into the fold and having him taste and it gets him going and then he starts to work on other projects he tends to cook a lot at home and uh, work out menus that way but i'll tell you i'll be walking through the kitchen i'm like what's that what are you doing oh is that it's not on i'm like okay oh but it's new good <laughs> And That's things like that. <laughs> that is so fun. Oh my gosh. I can just see you in that restaurant. Just like, hold on, what's going on there? Let's, what are you let's doing? pair that. Let's, um, you know, I, I have to throw in since we started talking about food and wine, um, a little bit about, you know, California wines and, um, you know, I have just grown more and more to love what California gives, even as an appellation. Our Vintner collection is based on uh, California wines. I know Jessica makes California wines. Um, Tonya and Emily, you work a lot with different California wines and, and can reference them in the world for us. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just hoping maybe you guys could tell me a little bit about you know, what inspires you most about the Appalachian itself um, in, in compared to other wines that you work with? Um, and also, I guess, just add a little bit about what you like pairing with California wines too. And I know every wine's different, but if you have sort of some favorites that you could share, that'd be really cool. Yeah, I, I love California wines. Um, you know, it, it's, I think there's a few things that are great about California. One of them being that it's such a big state and it, uh, that, that there's a lot of different climates that you can make everything from super restrained, high acid wines at the coast to really big, super massive wines in, in, in the hotter climates. There's just such a diversity of styles and climates and soils. And so it's not that it's not there's no kind of one note to California and even if you're doing just straight California appellated wines that I feel like winemakers have this opportunity to kind of do this palette of, of flavors within that wine that they can they they can borrow so much from these different regions in order to really fully round up the style of wine that they're making um, and and food wise I mean I think California generally tends to offer some pretty opulent flavors and and so you know foods that um, have a lot of great intensity and bright, big, bold flavors, I think are a really great go-to with California wines. I love that too about, you know, building this really special wine from such a broad region, because I think that's what makes it so fun for me. I mean, I've come from really small regions and then grown into developing these California Vintner Collection wines. And I find it just as fun and just as challenging um, and I love, of course, having a value price point um, our, where our vintner collection is under $25. Jessica, I know I see you out there um, running through the vineyards. I know you're super hands-on and you love being in touch with all of your uh, grape sourcing. And what, what do you love about California wines? Let's see. I love, it is, there are so many different microclimates to work with. So I love that, um, you know, if we, if we label a wine as California that we get to use, it's like a spice rack. So we can use, you know, like wines from uh, the North Valley from Lodi. We can use wines from the Central Coast. We can use wines from Livermore, from Santa Barbara, Napa, Sonoma, in, you know, as we make our Cabernet blend, for example. So it's, I, I, that's really, I, I think, um, the best part about the California Appalachian. Um, I really also enjoy that being a winemaker in California, that we're really allowed to be very innovative as well. Like we, we don't have, obviously we have compliance rules, but it's not as strict as some of the of other countries when it, when you're labeling it as like an, an, you know, a DOCG or a DOC, you have very strict rules that you need to follow. In California, we are, you know, as well, um, we have more, I, I feel like we have more flexibility to be innovative in the, in the wines that we're, we're making. And then you do want to vineyard specific. We, Right now, I, I work. Um, we have. I work a lot on the coast, and I'm very excited about the San Benito area. 
It, um, we just planted a vineyard there. It's very versatile. So you can, that, that climate actually, we're growing Chardonnay, but we're all uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir on one exposure. And then on the other exposure, Cabernet and Petit Verdot. And it, it, you're, we're really able to, um, it, I, it's a less, it's not a very well-known region, and, but the quality is amazing. So um, finding these little gems also in California is, is fun because I, I still feel like we have a lot of exploration to do uh, to yeah. find what varieties do well in other, in which region. Yeah, it, there is still so much pioneering and exploring to be done. Um, and I feel like we know that Cab and Chard and Pinot are kind of all the reigning varietals and what California is going to, but there's a lot of really fun eclectic wines that are grown throughout California too. And sometimes you just want to, you know, kind of shout out on a megaphone like, but you guys, you should try and, you know, shout that out. Um, what would you, what, what would you want to shout out, Tanya, from California, if you could get somebody attention um, on something that you've tried that you think grows well here but maybe not be hasn't been quite discovered for me it's probably um, aromatic um, white wines and um, there was a there was a time where we didn't see as as many um, representations of Viognier that were um, more in the category of the source. And now you have these waxy, um, white flowered, um, dried uh, pitted fruit, um, white wines that do have mineral, that do have acid, um, that are being produced now that are not over oaked or have very little oak um, at all. And um, I'll use Viognier as, as an example, um, but there's diverse demeanor, there's um, Gruner Veltlinger um, that's being grown um, as well um, down in Santa Barbara. Um, I tend to like the coast but I like it all. And if there happens to be something that's grown in an area that can be warm or maritime or Mediterranean, and what comes to mind is the Sierra Foothills and Amador County, which when we think of those areas, we think of Zinfandel, but there's more than Zinfandel that's grown there. Um, there's Iberian, um, varietals. There's also some roan white and red varietals as well. And they're not these um, massive saturated wines. There's actually minerals and, and rocks and um, dried, um, dried brush and all sorts of things within them. And they're just really beautiful. Um, and so, yeah, that's what's exciting. About well, you are speaking my love language right now because <laughs> we're all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Jessica and I both spent a lot of time in the Sierra foothills and uh, uncovering all kinds of stones with yeah. beautiful varietals um, hidden. And uh, I'll never forget, you know, the first time I tried to take a couple of Roan varietals out um, to sell, and this was about 15 years ago, and everybody just looks at you like, huh? Where, where, where is that from, and what is that? But um, exactly what you said, they're beautiful wines, and um, there's a lot of really, really beautiful wines to be discovered, and Viognier is one of those wines where right now, well, I've always loved Viognier, but it is getting hotter. It's People are catching yeah. on, and now that we can say it, and it ends with yay, like every other day of the week, and mm -hmm. now, you know, it's Friday, so, <laughs> right. so that's always good, um, but those are really neat suggestions. Gewürztraminer, I love mm -hmm. Um Emily, what, what have you been uh, seeking lately from California? You know, I've been really excited about some of these lighter reds. Like, I've seen a lot of winemakers, like, get really excited about... Um, you know, not just Pinot, but Gamay and Pulsar and Trousseau and these really like fun 
light wines and making these reds that are just so quaffable and, and refreshing and, you know, wines that you want to drink with a little bit of chill. And, you know, I, I've always believed that wine should not hit you between the, between the eyes to be good. And, and those are the wines that I've been most excited to see. Awesome. I like those too, especially you don't find them a lot. So you have to go somewhere, right? Like one of your restaurants or you have to hunt. You've got to hunt for these. Um, and I love being able to find some creative wines to, you know, explore it for our cause entrepreneurs. We have a wide range of uh, wines and one was Gewürztraminer actually. And just, you know, teaching everybody about the varietal itself and then, you know, how to pronounce it. Cause it is a mouthful. It's like you have marbles, you know, in your cheeks and you're trying to pronounce this thing, get it in the glass. But um, you guys just made those sound so good. Um, my mouth is watering. Uh, Jessica, I know when you've been stumbling around these vineyards, you found something that you love that you just wish you could make, you know, 200,000 cases of probably. What would it be? Let's see. Uh, we make 28 varietals at the winery. So we do, we have Gruner Veltliner, we have Albarino, we have um, Malvasia Bianca, uh, we Malbec, Petit Verdot, Cab Franc. Um, I'm really excited about the Cab Franc from San Benito. Um, but I, I, I do, I still, love um Zinfandel and I love I would love to have like a light sparkly um version of of Zin out there <laughs> mm -hmm. and I, I don't I don't I don't see it out there I haven't had it but I think that California could totally own it that would be really a fun wine for um for everybody um yeah, for I, you. I don't have a favorite because I it would be like picking a favorite child I <laughs> <laughs> don't yeah. want you to do that. <laughs> so I've got a sparkling Zin for you. Oh, you um, do? Shauna Rosenthal makes a, a sparkling Zinfandel that's really good. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Balanced, acid. I was just like, oh, wow, this is really delicious. Where is it from? I don't what? see as much sparkling, you know, red wine anymore there was a, a time where you would see like sparkling shiraz and things like that but of course on brusco but yeah That's amazing i love to hear this because there's so much more innovation um in california to come i have been talking about sparkling reds for years and i'm like yes it is going to come back i'm going to make mine out of barbera i think jessica but yes swap stories about how this is done um i am so thankful that you guys could join me today and share your experiences um about wine and your it, like super impressive careers to have three of you here dynamic wine lovers and wine professionals has just been a real highlight and thank you for sharing with all of us your experience your passion and dedication to the industry my pleasure Cheers. My pleasure. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Wow. How inspired do you feel after hearing from these incredible women? What really stood out to you? I always find it remarkable how the most successful people are always so down to earth. I loved how much this panel shared their passion for helping others, whether it's finding that special wine and seeing the customer's joy or making world-class wines enjoyed by many. I too share that joy when I'm making wines for our community. And so much of my why has evolved to be centered around your success. It wakes me up each day thinking about making wines for you to present to make an impact and an income. For many, success means being leaders in their community. And for others, it means financial freedom. Whatever brings you joy, I'm excited to be here with you and share your success. Did you hear some of their favorite eclectic California wines? Oh yeah, I did. How about Zinfandel that's in our wine club this quarter? Or Aromatic Whites, Gewürztraminer, Riesling, Viognier, and Muscat? Yep, we've got those two in our portfolio. My vision is to continue to bring eclectic varietals to our community along with our best-selling Vintner Collection wines from California. 
truly a winemaker's paradise. Our Vintner collection from California allows us to make the best wines from hand-picked subregions around the state. I loved hearing Jessica's passion for winemaking across California and the excitement around Emily's opulent pairing suggestions. How about leadership tips? These women have grown successful teams. Taking the time to listen is so important, as well as empowering your team with the tools they need to succeed. Tanya has worked her way up to the top from being a server at a restaurant all the way to sommelier in San Francisco. That extra effort really pays off big time when making a valuable contribution to change the world. I hope you enjoyed this panel and got a glimpse into the industry that you're all a part of because it all starts with sharing wine and giving hope. Cheers.